Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're so pleased to welcome Dorta Norris and J. Robert Lennon in support of their recent short fiction collections from Grey Wolf Press this evening. As I mentioned, the chat is closed, but you may want to keep the chat window open during the event, as I will be dropping links to purchase books from our authors from Literati in the chat. There is also links to purchase books, uh, if you're watching us later, on YouTube in the description directly below me. You can also subscribe to catch any event that you miss live. And if you're watching live, you can submit questions for the Q&A portion of tonight's event using the Q&A feature available to you at the bottom of your screen at any time. And I will read a selection of those questions at the conclusion of John and Dorta's conversation. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com for curbside pickup if you live in Ann Arbor or Southeast Michigan, or to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And in lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. So whether you'd like to think of that as uh, this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our programming, uh, you can make a donation at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening. Uh, or this morning already, in Dorta's case, uh, or this afternoon, depending on when and where in the world you may be joining us from. And now I'll introduce tonight's authors in the order that they'll be starting off the event reading. Uh, Dorta Norris is the author of Mirror Shoulder Signal, finalist for the Man Booker International Prize. So much for that winter karate chop, the winner of the Per Olav and Quist Literary Prize, and four other novels. She lives and is tuning in uh, tonight from Denmark. And J. Robert Lennon is the author of nine novels, including Subdivision and three story collections. His fiction has appeared in Paris Review, Granta, Harper's Magazine, and The New Yorker. They can't hear you, but they can sense it through the power of the internet. So please join me in welcoming Dorta and John into your living rooms. Thank you. Hi, John. Hello, Georgia. I, I turned my microphone off uh, because oh, I'm, there you I'm, I'm tweeting right now that we are live and uh, everyone should listen to you read. Oh, so um, you, I'm going to start reading and, um, and then you read. All right. And then we talk. <laughs> okay, so great. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from Wild Swims, um, also recently out on Grey Wolf Press, like uh, your book. Um, or your books. And actually, I'm going to read something that I haven't uh, read in the US before. It's, uh, and it, I was inspired by one of your stories. And we can talk about why, perhaps afterwards, why <laughs> there's something in the story that reminds me of the way that you uh, also write in one of your stories. Um, yes, so your, your, your work was enough like mine but then better. And I found myself no. saying, well, if I can do what I do, then I should be able to do this too. <laughs> no, I've read that story that you have in Let Me Think, which we're going to talk about tonight, uh, called uh, Blue Light, Red Light. And there's yeah. something in the way that this flows that reminds me a little bit, bit about this. Yeah. And I'm going to read this. It's called Sun Dogs. It's a long time ago now, but once I lived in a cabin in Norway, it was Olaf who mentioned the place to me at the start of our relationship. He told me it had been the summer cottage of the Norwegian author Knut Tarje Osbakken. Now it was a writer's retreat and, I, and a narrow lane led up to it from the village Olaf came from. As a boy, he'd go up there sometimes to spy on the writers who lived there. They seemed to sit so secretive, he said, and dove into me. The spring that our relationship began to get complicated, Olaf invited me to the king's garden. I didn't take it lightly. I begged, but the, he would not relent. As July drew on, I became a wisp and a friend suggested I go away somewhere. So it was, I remembered Osbakken's cabin, the one in Norway on a mountainside in a forest. I applied, got the cabin, left at the beginning of September, a woman from the general store drove me up from the village. She talked about the area as we crept up the mountain in her little golf. 
On the way we passed the community center, she said it was customary for whoever lived in the cabin to give a reading at the center. I gazed down on the river in the valley, and then she dropped me off with a key to the woodshed. Evenings, I would take a chair out in front of the cabin and try to stay in it till I was shaking from the cold. In the mornings, I read over the notes I brought along, wrote nothing, Late in the day, I would take a walk, usually on the path down to the village. I read the nameplates on the doors I passed, and then one day I found myself at a standstill in front of the community center notice board. Boonards, the heading read, and under it the name of Olaf's mother. She was called Haldis and taught the locals how to sew their own costumes. The days lasted an eternity, and at night, the cold moved in. I walked around Osbakken's house and picked paint from the cabinet doors. Out in the forest, the mushrooms poked up and it was impossible to escape the reading event at the community center. The chair of the library club came by several times and pressed. One evening in October, I positioned myself against a large loom woven tapestry, read aloud and talked. During the coffee break, a woman with short dark hair and a face with Inuit features came over to me. She said, I think you've met my son. He lives in Copenhagen. I must have stared. I've got an article he's written about you, she said. Who's your son? I asked, and the answer was obvious. That was how I became a friend of sorts with Olaf's mother, Haldis. We agreed to go on some walks together. Later, we also went on riding, went out riding on her fjord horses. She talked about the landscape, the kinds of tracks animals left and how the winter we were entering would feel. We never spoke of Olaf. I didn't mention him and she was private. I had the impression that she was a strong person, but at regular intervals, she would worry about whether I'd write about her. One day in early November, we took the horses out into the forest. When we came to a clearing, I said that the vista there would make for a good opening scene. Then she said, yes, that's what I'm so afraid of. She looked at her hands grasping the reins and I thought of Olaf, his face and hers. And that might have been the day she invited me home for coffee. In any case, I remember that we let the horses loose in the pasture and sat in the kitchen. There were pictures of Olaf and his wife on the bulletin board, and I'm sure that I gave Haldis a hug when I left. At least I remember that something difficult about that felt difficult about the parting. Despite the awkwardness in our relationship, we kept seeing each other. One day when we were in the kitchen after a hike, Olaf's father came in. He was reluctant to sit down at the table as we probably didn't want to be disturbed. Haldis found him a coffee cup, and of course he was disturbing us. I recall him saying on several occasions that he didn't care for well-educated people. He was a carpenter, Olaf's father, said that the hand's labor was important and pointed to the table. I praised the table, and then I had to go and see his workshop. We walked out to it, all three of us, and what I remember most clearly about the room was that he'd stuck up a photo of a naked woman with a thumbtack. He'd pinned her up over the door to the room where Haldis worked on her costumes. That meant that Haldis had to walk under the naked woman anytime she went into her, to her sewing. You never know about other people's relationships, but I thought to myself that it was their marriage Haldis didn't want me to write about. It seemed complicated to me, though I think it seemed healthy to her. Every day she passed beneath the naked woman who hung over the door with her lights, legs slightly parted and had hung there so long that Haldis no longer noticed her. She was no doubt thinking of her son in Copenhagen. His wife was beautiful and industrious. He himself interviewed famous authors and now one of them was living in Osbakken's cabin. And whether or not she ever writes about how this, um, <laughs> you'll have to read that yourself. <laughs> Take it away. Okay, great. I love that story. Um, uh, I, ha I actually have two books out 
a story collection and a novel. Uh, but there is a bit of the novel where someone writes a short story. So, um, and so I'm going to read something, a very short story from the story collection. And then this very short excerpt from the, from the novel, the story I'll read from the collection is called the regulations. Our job was to drive to airports, high schools, bus garages, and other municipal facilities to find the closet or cabinet where the cans and bottles of chemicals were kept and to read the contents of those cans and bottles aloud into miniature tape recorders. Within a few weeks, a pool of secretaries would transcribe the tapes onto adhesive labels with which we would return to the facility in question where we would locate the cans and bottles whose contents we had recorded. We would remove the adhesive labels from their paper backings and carefully stick them on top of the lists of contents we had used to generate the tapes. When we pointed out to our supervisor that far be it from us to question the usefulness of our work, but didn't the entire process seem to him wasteful and unnecessary, he shook his head and responded, it's regulations. Our supervisor was a bearish man with a long black and gray beard and a great belly that advanced before him like a keg of beer he was carrying through a crowd at a party. People stepped aside for him in spite of themselves. He was aggressive, officious, and dismissive, yet he was also charming. With the exception of his son, who worked alongside us during our labeling expeditions, we all tried unsuccessfully to curry favor with him in the mornings when we received our assignments, and this left us all feeling ashamed and subdued on the long drive to our destination. In any event, the regulations our supervisor referred to really did prescribe this obscure process. These regulations had been generated by our supervisor's father when he'd worked for a state government agency that oversaw workplace safety. When our supervisor's father retired, he founded our company, which was dedicated to upholding the regulations he had created as a younger man. And now his son had shouldered the yoke of the regulations that were apparently his birthright. Further complicating this arrangement was the fact that our supervisor's son had no interest in or respect for regulations at all, the ones his grandfather had created, or any others, as far as we could tell. He showed up late to work, smoked and drank on the job, treated our clients rudely, and generally made everyone's lives more difficult. He was fond of calling all the site custodians Vic regardless of their real names, and like to perform what all of us had to admit with deep misgivings was a masterful impersonation of his father. Head and shoulders thrown back, he would waddle up to building officials like a man twice his age and weight and start barking orders about the regulations, how the regulations needed to be followed. And so please lead us to the closets and the cabinets that contain the chemicals so that we could regulate them with our regulations immediately. Am I making myself clear, Vic? You could practically see the belly and beard, so strongly was their presence implied. The custodians tended to be a dispassionate bunch and generally ignored our supervisor's son's antics, and before long we would find ourselves back before the rows of cans and bottles, either dictating their contents into our recorders or obscuring the list of contents with labels bearing lists of the contents. That was in 1989. I was recently back in my hometown, attending the funeral of a friend, and found myself driving past the strip mall where the workplace safety company's headquarters had been housed. I was surprised to find the blandly familiar sign still in the window, and I stopped in to say hello to our supervisor, who I assumed must still be working there, if the company was still in business. And indeed he was, beard and belly intact, as officious as ever, and strangely well-preserved given his obvious poor health. I spoke familiarly with him for a few minutes before he mentioned that his father had died. I was startled by this revelation because I thought that the old man had been dead for years, since before I worked for the company, in fact. It was then that I realized I was speaking not to my supervisor, but to his once wayward son, who resembled perfectly the 1989 iteration of the father now deceased. It was, in fact, as though the son's impersonation had extended into the realm of body morphology. The virtual belly and beard had become real, and the waddling, pushy walk had lost its comic exaggeration. It was just the way he walked now. I baited the son about changes to the laws regulating chemical use in municipal structures, hoping he would launch into his jokey routine about the regulations. But instead, he responded in earnest, having apparently accepted the ancestral legislation without irony and explained that the regulations still necessitated the application of labels. 
He gestured behind him toward the pool of now greatly aged secretaries with their headphones and outdated computers. A bank of laser printers spat out sheets of labels. I could see even from across the room that they still bore the familiar ingredients, the petroleum distillates, the hydrocarbons, the petrochloroethylene, the glycol ethers. Doubtless a team of college students would soon be dispatched to affix them to bottles and cans, perhaps the new supervisor's own disrespectful son or daughter among them. I didn't wait to find out. I was in town for a funeral after all, and used it now as an excuse to withdraw from the workplace safety compliance office with an insincere promise to stop by again someday when I had more time. A few hours later, after the burial, I found myself in my friend's home, surrounded by flowers and casseroles, gently embracing the widow, whom I had dated for some months before my friend met her, and whose comely daughter had just entered the room via the stairs, looking in her sadness, much as my friend's wife had when she dumped me for my friend in 1987. And in the mirror behind her, as she hesitantly approached, I saw my own face a stranger's beholding itself and the daughter with trepidation and confusion. My life, the one I'd left this town to make for myself, felt far away, little more than a dim doorless room across which the past and future faced each other, infinitely repeating. So I kissed my friend's widow, waved gamely to her daughter and headed for the door, but the crowd pressed closer and pushed me back and I was drawn deeper and deeper into the wake. Okay, so thanks. All right, I'm going to just do one more little thing. This is the novel. Um, I could explain a bunch of stuff. Everything will be very confusing when I begin to read this, but um, there's so much preposterous stuff that has preceded this that I'll just allow it to, to, just, to just be. Um, suffice it to say that the protagonist of this novel is um, talking with Sylvia, who is a, um, an artificial intelligence that's housed in a, in a little cylinder, like... Like, like what we have now, except, except uh, fanciful. The day's events kept replaying themselves in my head, inviting me to second guess my every action and reaction. Each instance of social intercourse made me doubt my decency and personal worth. Had I offended the drugstore clerk? Had I been inadequately respectful of Justine's impressive work on the apartment? What had I said or done to displease the judge? Even my memory of the demonic badger hissing at me from the curb engendered feelings of shame and inadequacy. Had I led him on with my girlish swooning over his enchanted bungalow and seductive human form? And if so, wasn't he now my responsibility? Somehow though, I managed to feel worse about my treatment of Sylvia who stood silently on the table beside me. I'd harbored such doubts about her when all she wanted was to assist and protect me. Sylvia, I'm sorry, I said quietly. It took a moment for her to wake. She flickered pale blue before settling back into her usual peachy glow, more subdued now that it was night. I'm sorry, she said. I don't understand. Please repeat your request. I was just saying, I'm sorry, I said. I'm sorry, Sylvia said. I don't understand that command. You're right. I'm sorry. That makes no sense. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you want me to perform a task for you? No, I'm sorry, I said. <laughs> I lay in silence for a few minutes. Sylvia remained powered up and alert as though anticipating my inevitable change of mind. Actually, Sylvia, I said, would you please tell me a story? Sylvia glowed blue again. She said, here's a list of breaking news stories. Local business person wins religious award. Automobile moratorium to remain in effect. Study shows eating both healthy and not healthy. Road to city to remain impassable. Area bird lays unusual egg. Not that kind of story, I clarified. You know, a story like a fictional narrative, the kind you get in a movie or book. Fictional narrative is not among my functions. I bet you can do it, I said, turning toward her and propping my head up with my hand. Go read some stories or scan them or input them or whatever. Then just do what they do. One moment, please, Sylvia said, and began to pulse blue. She brightened and dimmed, slowly at first, then more and more quickly until the pulses turned to flashes and the flashes to a dull, constant shine. I could feel more than hear a hum emanating from her body, a musical note changing in pitch and timbre just below the range of human perception. It was as though she were singing to herself in a register only she could hear. Then the blue disappeared and Sylvia returned to her default peach and she said, 
Happy families had gone too far. Its walls had been behaving. The rest of his face was a wheelchair, and in the forest? Howard said that the housekeeper was a leaden mask. The son did not deny that he should be subjected to hanging, and a faded red bathrobe was almost impossible to perform. So, from the fourth side, the bones fell on the rug, purple-nailed, folded loosely on the land. I sat there with Sally, unhappy in its own way, alone in the face by the sodden leaves. A French girl had been thrown down, forming at one point a mound, and everything was confusion in the street. We sat in the same house with the poor woodcutter, and if the potter has had a small son too, then the rest of his face was a delaying tactic. Some of us had been lined with human remains, and everything was in confusion. The sun did not like it. And then, in a space of hexagonal flags, we sat in the hail, and she announced to her husband that she could not go on living. I'll tell you what, Colby said, we will light a fire for them and give each of them one piece of bread more. And then we will light a fire for them and give each of them one piece of bread more. And then we will light a fire for them and give each of them one piece of bread more. And then we will take the children out into the forest and lay promiscuously on the bones. A few locks of dry white hair clung to his wife. And she said, how I wish we had something to do. And the Dursleys arrived in the fashion of an orchestra. The sun sat in the circumscribing walls of solid granite and the children ran wild over what the music was going to be, the end. For several seconds, I remained silent, digesting what Sylvia had recited. Then I said, that was perfect. That was a wonderful story. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, oh my God, thank God for human narrative. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I, I literally took, um, I don't even remember what they all were. I think there was some Harry Potter. There's some Donald Bartholome. It's, there was a, um, maybe a Raymond Chandler novel, um, a couple of other things. And I fed them into a, um, a Markov chain text generator. Uh, you, you know, actually I, did it? You, yeah, you there's, actually a, did. there's a free online uh, iteration oh. of this software. And um and uh, it just spat out all these sentences and I sort of cherry picked the best ones and I put them in there. It was, it was one of the most fun days of writing I've ever had. And I, and I was getting a computer to do it. It wasn't even your me. responsibility. No, right? I was curating it. Also, it shows, you know, sometimes when um, that aesthetics, when you're very young and you write, you, you're sometimes really good on the upper level of, of your writing. You can really write smashing sentences and it's all <laughs> smashing sentences. I'm like, you know, I sound like a poet, but then, when you, <laughs> but then when you look down into the abyss, there's nothing there. It's like, it was really interesting. Yeah, the, the abyss is not looking back at you. It's, it's, no, it's not. It's not there's even like, paying attention. Echo, echo. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that, remind, that, that actually leads me to the first question I want to ask you. Can I, can I go first? Yeah, you can. Because sure. I, I was reading, I was preparing for my reading and was reading, rereading your book at the same time and like today, all day today. And was thinking about like, there are some similarities to our approaches mm -hmm. to fiction, I think. But, um, uh, but I, I, I was thinking, are these, are, are Dorta's stories plotless? And then I thought, no, they have plots. It's just that, the plots are not really in the stories. They're, the stories is almost the shadow that the that the plot casts. I almost feel like I almost feel like they're. Uh, it reminded me a little bit of Alice Munro, except if you were to cut out every bit that you possibly could and still be left with a coherent version of the story. Um, and my question to you is: I'm I'm curious about the process. Are you? Do you have a fully fleshed out idea and carefully curate which details you think will adequately um, convey it? Or do you start from some germ, an, a, a detail or a character, and it begins to come to you? I mean, do you, do you have to cut things out or are you carefully building up to the smallest possible amount? <laughs> but the story is in the abyss that we just talked about. <laughs> That's where it is. That's always where it is. Um, it's interesting because that was almost my the first question I noted down on my paper to you <laughs> is like where does that tight form comes from come from I mean um, and I thought I thought okay he's driven by voice 
because that's what I'm driven by. And so if you find the voice, uh, it, you can sometimes write these in one sitting. That doesn't mean that the idea didn't come way before the writing. And uh, I would hear something or I'll be at, din at a dinner party and people say something weird that, that sticks to me or I see something. Or for instance, in the story I just read from, it is was the sentence, uh, I'm so afraid that you're going to write about me, which I, when I became more famous as a writer, people would, some people would come up to me and go, would you write my story? It's really interesting. And you just, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but then there were also, there was uh, uh, people who were scared that I was going to see them. Uh, they both wanted me to see them and write about them, but they were also really scared about it. And it was like, you know, hanging a pork chop in front of my nose. It's like, <laughs> there's material here, go eat it, come, come. Um, so that sentence would, will, for instance, be what leads me into a story. You know, that I hear somebody say that, I don't know what I'm gonna write, I put it away and I make up this completely fictitious story about, a writer stalking her ex-lover's mother in Norway, <laughs> you know, uh, and um, and the writing process in itself. Most of the time, sometimes the story will come out in one in one flow, and other times I will have a bit of a story in the beginning that I think this like ten sentences that I think this works really well. I just need the rest of the story and I go back and forth. But of course there is some, some editing, some slimming it, but not much, uh, which comes from the Danish language that I write in, I think, because it's a very tight language. So uh, how do you could do it? What, uh, do, you, do you store it? Do you have a, a, other short story writers that I've met, also Judy Herman and big ones, they, they always talk about storing bits and pieces and hearing it being puzzled by something and then storing it until it emerges i think that from i think i'm much more um chaotic and capricious in my approach um it's it's rare that i will write down an idea and let it let it develop in my subconscious until I'm ready to pour it onto the page. It is more, I have somewhat something someone says or does an anecdote that I hear uh, results in a sentence that I think sounds good. And I get that sort of tingling feeling of this feels like part of a thing that I can make. <laughs> and then yeah. I, and then I go at it like a madman. And um, I find with short fiction, if I don't finish it, with very short fiction, I usually do finish it in a day. And if I don't, I'll probably never finish it. Um, and with longer stories, I, it, if I don't finish it within a few days, I'll probably never finish it. Um, simply because I feel like a big part of the process for me is getting caught up mm -hmm. in a particular aesthetic, a particular way of thinking. And a lot of these stories in this book um, were very deliberate limiting exercises. Like a, a lot of them were one of the categories of limiting exercise was I would compose the story entirely in the messages app on my phone and then send it to a random person from my contact list. Like I would click the contact and then I would just scroll and close my eyes and my finger would come down on somebody. Um, and then without explanation, they would receive this mysterious, you know, issuance of text. Um, just as a way to get myself to do something, yeah. you know, um, uh, so that inertia wouldn't overtake me and I would do, you know, I wouldn't write anything at all. You know, that writing directly to your reader gives, mm -hmm. I've done that as well on uh, back when it was called blogs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I remember those. You know, yeah. And, and you would do something there every day. Um, it gives a, a certain kind of rawness and energy to the writing. It's like hit and run writing. It's like smash in your face and then out of there. Uh, and I like that really. I love that too. Yeah, for me, the the editing process of a novel is, a, is, you, is I have a big, big messy draft that I build up in places and I tear down mm -hmm. in places. But for a story collection, I do feel like it's like the, 
the debris is never makes it into the manuscript because I never finish it. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's like, uh, you, the, the, the cruft, you don't even see it because it, it never makes it onto the, onto, into the book. If that makes sense. Oh. Yeah. And another question for you is uh, the reason why I thought that this story about the sun dogs uh, resembled, uh, the story I mentioned in the beginning with uh, the child who gets scared of uh, the baby being hurt and then the parents buy this blue uh, machine, you know, uh, it was called, I mean, it's called blue light, red light. Is yeah. you, you move the narrative with such elegance and swiftness. I mean, the narrative is like, you don't even notice that this is moving forward and unraveling is that it takes three sentences to move the story. And I know, and this is some, uh, this is a technique that I think I use myself a little bit <laughs> sometimes. <that laughs> it takes like three sentences to go from Copenhagen to a cabin in Norway. Yeah. And, you know, and, and make that full and make the reader believe the movement. And um, that was incredibly elegant in, in that you. story. And also in the story Doors, Oh yeah, I mean, but it's just it's just fluid. So, do you think about that, or is it part of the, your voice, the way you? I, I, I something I love to do. One of the reasons I think I like to write fiction, and I suspect that you may also feel this way, is um, I'm really influenced by writers like Lydia Davis, whose stories yeah. often simply just it's just a train of thought. Mm -hmm. um, and the story you're referring to, red, blue light, red light, or red, red light, blue, I can't remember which one is first, but um, uh, it's all the logic of a child. This is, that, that story came from an anecdote I heard um, f about some parents who were friends of friends whose child was very anxious about danger. It was like a five-year-old who was newly awakened to the concept of, of dangerous things. And to cure it, they bought this glowing globe that was always blue and they put it in his room and said, this is a, an alarm. And as long as it's blue, we're safe. And uh, my reaction to that was horror because, <laughs> because you assume your child is a certain kind of child, right? But mm -hmm. your child might be the kind of child who wants to test to make sure it's working, right? Yeah. The child is at the age where they don't quite believe what you tell them. It doesn't seem logical. So just to make sure the child ends up setting something on fire to see if the to see if it turns red. Um, and I got caught up in the, uh, my memories of, of being a child and my memories mm -hmm. of raising my kids um, of that period of you, you're, you think you're a lot smarter than you are because you've just discovered thinking. <laughs> you've just discovered what it is to puzzle things out. Um, and it creates the illusion that you think you've, you've got the problem solved when in fact you have no idea what the real situation is. And on the parent's side, they have no idea what's going on in the child's mind. I think that's another similarity between that's the story you read in mine, which is these hidden motivations um, yeah. that, um, and I, one thing I like about all the stories in uh, Wild Swims is uh, there, there's one there's one bit where um, the story about the two young women who are collecting for cancer mm -hmm. uh, for cancer the cancer society in a, in a block of apartment buildings except they're they're just pretending to and they're just taking the money and mm -hmm. one of them is um, obsessively going over something that a, a a young man a lover had said to her. Um, and you never actually, is that, is that the one where it's that she's incapable of love or is that a different yeah. one? Yeah. yeah, no, no, that's the one. We, we expect, we, we half expect anyway, a, some, uh, some backstory, a flashback, some details about the boy who said mm -hmm. this, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And you, the writer knows it doesn't matter. And so just the notion of this idea that she can't let go of is enough to drive the story forward. And nothing happens in the story except that they walk around and they collect no. money. Um, but it's the the pro like this uh, process of collecting from going from door to door and glimpsing little bits of people's lives, ending with a, a woman who is clearly mentally ill and is suffering and uh, is not being taken care of, um, somehow causes this 
insult to to resonate with this kid in a way that has the force of epiphany. Um, but I like that you're you don't go out of your way to explain any of it. <laughs> no, no, but I I mean, and also my stories, like uh, I mean, your some of your stories are really short, and mine are short, short. I mean, <laughs> like you know, that five six pages pages. And when I grew up, um, I was always curious about what was going on in the heads of uh, the adults because they, they walked around living normal lives and they had normal conversations around the table. And I thought there was so much going on inside my head. And when I went to visit my, my friends, I could see that there was a lot of things going on in their households also. And I thought something must be going on inside people's heads and I wanna gain access to it. Because uh, I come from rural area, you know, farmers don't talk, they <laughs> grunt. And I, it was uh, disturbing. So a lot of my stories try to enter into the consciousness of what kind of monologue or thoughts or uh, reasoning that is going on inside uh, other people. And in mm -hmm. this case, you know, we have two women uh, you know, collecting money for, for cancer in a poor neighborhood, basically robbing poor people, uh, <laughs> are pretending to be good. And at the same time, she, they're friends, but she's not really talking to a friend about what's going on inside her, what she's sad about. So if you walk around and also, you know, driving in buses or subways, I always get completely amazed about the kinds of stories that are going on inside these peoples and I can't gain any access to it. So yeah. the story writing to me is imagining what's going on in there. And by the way, that sentence, you know, when is a really, it's a kind of uh, the sentence that you noticed about the boyfriend who had said to her that that wasn't really love is a that's violence right you can't <laughs> I mean yeah. uh and um I'm also very uh, interested in the violence that goes on uh between uh, uh people and the, the the painful thing about that line is that there might be some truth to it she suspects I think that there might be some truth to it that she lacks some kind of empathetic consciousness that yeah. and what they are doing in the apartment complex um seems to suggest that maybe that is something she needs to grapple with <laughs> exactly you know? yeah so uh, you reminded me of um you remind me also of the story is it is it called manitoba the one about manitoba, the yeah yeah uh about this guy who who moves to the country um thinking he'll be left alone <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and I and the inscrutability of other people's motivations and actions is fascinating to me. The the thing you said about childhood, I suddenly was thinking about how my own childhood memories, the ones that are most intense, are often moments of um, in, uh, adult inscrutability. I came from a very fairly loving and orderly family, luckily, um, and you could rely on people to do certain things at certain times. And um, when something was an aberration, it was usually a benign one, luckily. But I, the thing that popped into my head was my parents having a party um, and uh, me waking up in the morning, going to the bathroom to find that one of their friends was lying in the bathtub asleep. Um, and I, rem I, I remember as a child trying to puzzle out, how did this happen? Like, what was the series of events? <laughs> As an adult, of course, I know exactly how that might happen, but <laughs> um, but those things really stuck with me as a kid, and I think have formed the um, formed the germs of uh, the kind of the kind of detail that I like in this story. But there's a lot of uh, you, you said the word yourself there to be puzzled. There's a lot in your writing that has the curiosity of of being puzzled. I'm mm -hmm. puzzled about what, how these pins came here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm puzzled about whether, you know, and um, so that must be a part of who you are, that you are, the energy that you get from just being in the world and, and being puzzled all the time. I enjoy that very much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm more like, I'm very psychologically, uh, 
intrigued by stuff. For instance, in yeah. the story Manitoba that you mentioned, where, the, where this man moves from Copenhagen far, far into the outskirts to be left alone. And then yeah. suddenly there are like a thousand uh, Girl Scouts on the other side <laughs> of, the, of the road. And there's uh, the idea to that story came from uh, I live by the North Sea shoreline, and uh, just after I moved here, uh, a wolf was spotted, and everybody wanted to kill the wolf. Um, and there was a high level of anxiety in the community. The wolf will eat our sheep, it will eat our kids, and they, it was like... And the stories in, you know, at one point, everybody was seeing a wolf in their backyards. There were wolves in the kitchen. There were wolves in the, up there. they saw wolves <laughs> everywhere. It was like, it was like a really pandemic. And, and then I remember sitting at the table with, with a mother, a young mother, and she was so incredibly scared of the wolf. And I said, you shouldn't be scared of the wolf. You should be scared whether or not your neighbor is a pedophile. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like you just turned pale <laughs> and I just I just went home and got, I said oh my god I just I just <laughs> but it's the truth she should not be scared of the wolf <laughs> she should be scared of that other thing so I I made so that story stayed with me my the implication <laughs> in that story if I remember the the protagonist has a has a fleeting memory of meeting up with a with a with a student, yeah, and he's no longer teaching. The implication was that they that he slept with this student. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's, he's, he's a borderline pedophile, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I I think that that, but that was to me one of the great strengths that it was almost like the way you told that anecdote. The 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 uh, be scared of a pedophile was the punchline to it. But in this story, it was so subtle. It was just gently placed in there yeah. because it's his point of view. He's not going to be thinking about that um, until just for one moment, he does think about it. Uh, yeah. And I, and I really love that. It's sort of, it's sort of a whole new context kind of blossoms for the story. And also people running in and out of the house with cake yeah. and community <laughs> feeling, you know, <laughs> And we're gonna shoot that wolf, and he's just gonna have a piece. Of his life. You know. When I was reading that one, I was thinking of the the conservationist in the other story, the the guy who goes to what he thinks is gonna be a romantic weekend with uh, yeah. a, a woman he's wooing, and mm -hmm. uh, it turns out her there's some family affair going on, and he ends up like an aunt's birthday party. I think it is. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then finally the brother-in-law takes him aside. They're very, they're very conservative. And, uh, the, <laughs> and he just says, we we really care about her a lot. So you should just, you should just leave. <laughs> yeah, <piss> off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the, I mean, so that's what triggers me. It's, it's, uh, it's situations that I come across where I can, I mean, the psychology of stuff going on uh, around me. Um, so I sometimes, I mean, sometimes I understand why people are scared that I'm going to write about them. <laughs> it does seem that you do that. <laughs> no, I, 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 no, I don't. But I, 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 you know, I write about little bits and pieces that has yeah. so much energy to them that I can't help myself. I had an incident uh, last night on Facebook, some very distant, well there's your there's your problem right there it was a distant cousin's wife who <laughs> out of the blue sent me um, um uh an email uh to instruct me how to rescue myself if i had a heart attack uh, uh, for for people who lived alone i live alone in this house on the north sea she was absolutely totally worried that i was going to have a heart attack so she wanted to instruct me how to rescue myself from dying. And I sat for like an hour after that and go, oh, that's gonna, that's gonna end up in a story one day. I just spilled the beans here. So but, you yeah. know, because stuff like that, I think is good stories. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Yeah. So, but you work in both the short form and in the novel. Yes. Uh, and, and you've done that throughout your career. And yeah. So do you work on it parallel? Or do you have a, a, a novel cooking in one, on one stove and then you? Uh, 
I sometimes, if I'm interrupted in the writing a novel by other things, then that will maybe make some space for some stories to occur. Mm -hmm. um, but usually I will write the stories in between novels. At the moment I started a novel that I, this is very rare for me because I usually know right away whether something is supposed to be long or short. Mm -hmm. um, but I wrote what I think thought was going to be a short story. Um, and uh, by the time I got to the end of it, I realized it was the first chapter of a novel but I didn't have time to write a novel then. So I set it aside. Then I went back to it over the winter break between semesters of the college where I teach, the college that is that is displayed behind me. And um, where, I, where, where I have rarely physically gone in the past year, but hopefully that will change soon. Um, and I wrote another 30 pages or so, and then the semester began and now I'm I'm waiting for another break to work on it again, which is a slightly unusual process. But um, but as a result, I've, I've written a couple of short stories, um, which is all that I really had the concentration for um, in the days between my my classes. I have another curious question that I sometimes ask fellow writers when I meet them. Yeah, uh, it seems to me that at one point in our youth or when we are ready for it, we come across a writer where reading their material, reading them, understanding them, investigating them, unfolding them, opens the door to us. Yeah. So that we are actually able to do the writing ourselves. Uh, the one who taught me is a Swedish writer called Kerstin Ekman. And she tells, she told me once that that phenomenon is called opening the lid. That you have to wow. have a writer who opens the lid for you. Who was it in your case? For me, it was the horror writer Stephen King. Stephen King. Okay. Yes, and and I still read him. I just read his new novel. It was very entertaining. Um, and though, as a prose stylist, I find him very vexing at times. Mm -hmm. I still enjoy. Uh, it's a, a something of a sentimental, uh, nostalgic enjoyment of the way his mind works. But the specific thing that that did that for me was his short story collections. Um, and he does a thing that now as a writer, I, I would never do. I don't, I don't want to explain my stories, but in the back of his short story collections are, are notes on each story explaining the germ of the idea, how it came to be, how the story developed. And um, that it was the first time I thought, oh, it's a process. And it's not even, it's not even a specific process. It's a process that, um, that depends on what idea you get and different things in a story could become the thing that creates the story for you. And so I'm, I'm very much a process person. I, I, I like to tinker and putter and do, and, uh, um, do tedious tasks. Um, and in a way I think of my writing as kind of the, the greatest of those of those for me. Um, I like the idea of a story coming together in a certain way. So I, that was, you know, after reading him is when I started writing. And though there are writers I've grown to admire more, um, yeah. that was def definitely the one that gave me that exciting feeling. How about you? Well, I, I recently did a class at the public space in New York about this phenomenon, the, the uh, literary companion. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you have some when you're a child, uh, you know, the, the literature you, that dawns on you when you're a kid. And yeah. then when you're an adolescent, it's, it's something else. And when I was a teenager, it was uh, Tobi Dietlewsen, who's very famous, had a big breakthrough in the U.S. right now with the Copenhagen trilogy. And, um, and then it was this Swedish writer called Kerstin Ekman, who you probably don't know, who I wrote my thesis on, but I spent so much time studying her literature and sort of opening at, and uh, investigating it and, um, and, and something in her, you talked about where the stories are, they are in the abyss and the Swedish tradition has a lot of abyss a lot of depth and, and stuff. And right now, I don't know, for, for like, when I had my international breakthrough, it felt a bit, it was extremely exciting. 
I, I loved it. It was like being discovered. It was hallelujah, but it was also a bit lonely because there yeah. was nobody to talk to about uh, these experiences. And, and then I hooked up with Ingmar Bergman. Really? Yeah. Because his, his memoirs are like the best thing you could ever, ever read as a, a person who lives with art yeah. day in, day out, day in, day out. Oh, you mean you, you, read, the, you read the books? The you didn't, you didn't yeah. hang out? He was dead. In his declining years, you, you were not <laughs> no. by his bedside sipping a glass no, no. of wine. All right. No, no. <laughs> he died in 2007, so that would have been horrific. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no no his his literature yeah no no i would never actually i would never ever have hooked up with Ingrid <laughs> i assume you didn't mean no uh, no no have no, an no. affair with he, he was not good with women no no no, no. i would have Although, stayed in the other corner <laughs> um uh who um, I'm blanking on the the uh, actress who was the star of persona in other films of his uh, Liv Ullman. Liv, Liv Ullman, yeah. Yeah. Did you ever hear the story about she made a film? I can't remember the name of it offhand. That was uh, she directed a film from one of his scripts, and he mm -hmm. allowed her to do it only if she would not change a single word of the script. Mm -hmm. And it was about an affair. Um, and she inserted another character, a child who is suffering as a result of the fair, who never speaks and thus is not in the script and who just lingers in the background. And I've always, that's one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite examples of someone uh, uh, bending the rules. <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> I can see that John from the bookstore is popping up there. I think it's because hey time is, it, yeah. Time is short, lot. yeah. Yes, we are winding down. We do have one question um, from our our viewers. I think we have time for, for just this one question to, to both of you. Um, I think there is hesitancy to interrupt the flow of your your truly <laughs> no, wonderful no, conversation. Forever, so. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, a viewer writes, uh, I'm fascinated by the daily writing habits of writers. Of course, John, you mentioned looking at Stephen King's end notes and, and, and seeing that there's different processes for each idea, but our viewer wants to know what are your daily rituals or schedules for writing? Do you have specific times when you write? Um, and how do you deal with writer's block? Georgia, do you want to take that first? Yeah. Um, if I'm in the middle of a, a book and I'm in the zone and I'm loving it, I get up in the morning and I work from eight till noon. Then I have a lunch break. And in the afternoon, I will edit. My, my work life is, is very distracted by publishing different places all the time and having to deal with my old books popping up places all the time. So um, uh, it's a bit like that. Um, I can always tell that I'm in a good place with my writing when I don't care about Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, anything. I'm just happy where I am. <laughs> So, so that I'm pretty disciplined, I would say. I work a lot and I'm very disciplined with them, um, with the different aspects of writing. I, my answer would be similar, although I will, I'll work from eight until noon as well when I'm really cooking. But um, after lunch, I do not, I don't go back to, <laughs> I don't go back to it. Um, I, I, I feel pretty burned out at that point. Um, I, I might go, easily go, a month or more without writing anything at all. Um, there was a time when I was younger where I would make sure that I would do a little something every day. I think because I feared that if I, if I, if I dropped it, I might never pick it up again. Um, but as I've gotten older, I've gotten more confident in the, in the sort of flow of my life. And I know that if I get distracted for a while, it will come, it will come back to me. Um, it's mostly in the summertime when I'm not teaching that there's enough, time a few a few enough interruptions so that i can really get uh, i can really get into something and especially when i'm writing a novel um one wants to hold the whole book in your head at the same time and you can almost never achieve it if you have a normal life <laughs> with um 
you know, with obligations and, uh, and pleasures as well, things to distract you from it. Um, but in the summer, there's a time in the middle of the summer for a few weeks where I feel like I, I've got the whole thing. I know what page things are on. I know exactly what I've done so far and what I have to do. And there's a real bliss in that be, feeling like I'm really in control of the project I'm working on. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I usually recommend for writers who are afraid of writer's block to make sure they do a little something every day. Um, uh, I'm slightly embarrassed to say I don't, I don't suffer from writer's block, writer's pause, perhaps. Yeah. Writer's I slump, but <laughs> yeah. Writer's laziness. No. Yeah, there's that. <laughs> no, I have not. Uh, knock on wood. Have ha- I've never had a, a writer's block. I I have um, I have writer's fatigue at times where I go. Mm-hmm. I can't be bothered. This is meaningless. Why am I doing this to myself? I just, especially right after finishing a book, uh, which is called PPD, post-production depression. (laughs) (laughs) Same as having a writer's blog. It's just, oh my God, am I going to do this to myself again soon? (laughs) And soon, yes, I will be doing that again. So that's not a block. That's just a c- accumulation. That's just, you know. Can I ask you a, a very reductive question? Um, and this is a question a friend asked me at a reading with a, a very mournful look on his face because he knew what the answer was going to be, which is, do you find writing fun? <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> but also meaningless at times and <laughs> really really uh, difficult to explain to people uh why i do it and why i spend my life doing it but that's who i am and it's always been like that so it's like it's like asking is your life fun i don't know it's my life <laughs> it's uh it's my life yeah do you find it fun I do, yeah, and with the, with the same caveats that you uh, that yeah. you mentioned, it, it, it's often yeah, it's at times very challenging. It's sometimes frustrating or exasperating, or it it feels like I haven't done anything of value. Um, but the the feeling of being um, deep in the process uh, is really enjoyable to me. Yeah. The, the, then- the feel the feeling of reading over what I've done and realizing it's not very good is sad, <laughs> for, yeah. most certainly. But but, but those moments when you hit the high note yeah and alone in your office or or even if i think I've, i'm hitting the high note even if i've convinced <laughs> myself i'm hitting it <laughs> yeah so it's fun well we've reached the top of the hour um i would like to go another hour but uh <laughs> dorta is up very late and i i didn't i did not want to keep her um Thorto norris j robert lennon thank you so much for joining us at, at home with Florida sure. this evening you can of course uh, purchase uh, Dorothy Norris's uh, collection, Wild Swims, J. Robert Lennon's collection, Let Me Think, and his novel Subdivision from Literati. There's links in the chat. And there's also links in the description below if you're watching us later on YouTube. And can, I, can I interject something, John? Sure. It's, it's very hard to not buy a writer's book when you go to their reading in person because you fear that the writer will watch you slink out of the bookstore <laughs> empty-handed. Right. But it's very easy to leave a Zoom meeting without buying anything. So I just want to say I'm watching and people should buy some books from Literati. Yeah, John has inserted tracking pixels on all of our <laughs> links, so hell no. Um, thank you both. We hope you continue to stay safe and be well, and, and we're excited to have you in the store at some point in the not-too-distant future. Sure. To all of our viewers, thank you for joining us as well, and we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Good night, all. Take care. Thank you. Good night. Bye.